The aerodynamics of any race car really plays a vital role in its success. In figure one, we see a race car that approximates a Formula student car. One major similarity is the very large rear wing, but most open wheel race cars approximate this geometry, sharing the front wing, the side pods, the rear wing, and underbodies. Usually these cars are optimized for straight line conditions. That's not to say that its aerodynamics are not important when turning, for example, but anything that isn't straight on usually has far fewer resources thrown at it to really optimize it. One of the major reasons why is constraints and resources. The governing body might limit how much wind tunnel time you can use. For example, in F1, they do that. Or maybe you can use as much as you like, but at some point you're going to run out of time and money. So in this podcast, we'll be looking at how different crosswinds like you'd have during cornering affect this car's aerodynamics. The authors of this study did a pretty good job where they tested a bunch of different angles and the results are a little bit surprising. For example, one expected trend is that when you were to yaw the car, so when the wind is coming in at an angle, the drag should increase, but as we'll see later on, that's not always the case. Anyway, for those interested in downloading this paper, it is called Aerodynamic Research of a Race Car Based on Wind Tunnel Tests and Computational Fluid Dynamics. It's open access, so you can find the link below. And the DOI is at the end of the page, so at the top of the page in this one. Let's get into how different cornering angles affect this car's aerodynamics. So the authors used wind tunnel tests and CFD to look into this, and nice touch is that they looked at different speeds as well. So for the wind tunnel tests, understandably, they were limited to just two speeds, 16 kph and 48 kph, which is about 10 and 30 miles per hour respectively, and with no side slip just for the angle of attack they looked at and just for the rear wing. But for their CFD, they looked at a dozen different speeds and different side slip angles and for the entire car. They don't give many details about their wind tunnel tests though or the CFD setup. So there's quite a bit left to the imagination, but one good thing is that they did a very good validation test, which we can see the results of in figure four. So down here, we have a few graphs. One thing I should stress again is that this is just for the wing and not for the entire car, this validation part. Once we get into just purely the CFD, then we'll be looking at the car as well. Another important thing to note is that this wing that they tested was a NACA 7048. Now, I can't see this geometry in their paper anywhere, so I don't know if this is actually a typo or not. The reason why I think that is because <laughs> a NACA 7048 wing is really weird. What that name means is that this wing has a maximum camber of 7% of the cord, which is, isn't too extreme. It's, it's a little bit on the high end, but not too extreme. It's still within reason. But then that camber occurs right at the leading edge, which I don't quite understand. I don't get how the maximum camber can occur right at the leading edge. Another thing that's a little unusual is that this NACA 7048 has a maximum thickness of 48% of the cord. That's really thick. Even the most common thick airfoils you come across, like wind turbine blades, for example, are more around 30%. So 48% is almost turning the wing into an oval. It's very much like a, a raindrop, like an idealized raindrop shape. So to give you an idea of what a typical wing might be, a basic airplane wing might be a NACA 4412, which means that the maximum camber is 4%, not 7%, like you have here. And that maximum camber of 4% occurs 40% from the leading edge of the wing not right at the leading edge like we have here. Again, I don't quite understand that geometry, what it would look like. And because we don't have any clear pictures of it, I can't tell if it's a typo or not. If you were to make this geometry, what you would see is that putting the camber right at the leading edge just effectively pitches the wing up. It's really an odd geometry. In effect, as I said, this is pretty much an idealized range up at an angle of attack. So for an airplane wing of 44, like a NACA 4412, the maximum thickness is 12% of the cord, not 48%. So this is just really weird. Anyway, let's explain what's going on in these graphs. So the top two plots are for 16 kph, and then the bottom two here are for 48 kph. The x axes are for the angle of attack, and the blue bars are for the wind tunnel test results, and the red bars are for the CFD results. One thing that they should have done is really plotted the downforce and drag in a non dimensionalized way, so coefficients. It's not a big deal, but it's just good practice. So first of all, the red bars line up pretty well with the blue bars. At the very least, the trends are very good. They're very similar. Perhaps the only standout bad one is for the second graph here, which is for the drag at 16 kph. If we look at 20 degrees, so that's 20 degrees angle attack. At the end here, we see maybe a 20% discrepancy. 
that's a lot more than like the 5% or so we see across the board for everything else. And because we're talking about wings here, that might be because of inaccurate flow separation prediction by the CFD. And because we don't have many details about the CFD setup, it's kind of hard to tell. But that, but uh, other than that outlier, everything else looks pretty good. I think that just the CFD didn't predict flow separation very well here. And in particular, I think the CFD is not predicting deep stall properly. The reason I say that is that if you look at the trend line for the drag production, so this second graph here, there is a drag bucket forming. At 10 degrees, we get the lowest drag, and then it increases either side of that. At 15 degrees, we're getting a little bit of separation, I think, because the drag increases so much, so some of the airfoil surface should be seeing separated flow, and hence greater pressure drag. At 20%, uh, sorry, 20 degrees, because we see a large drag increase, we can be pretty confident that we're reaching proper stall and even deep stall. So I think the CFD is breaking down here. Now, usually you'd use the lift to determine the stool characteristics, uh, the down, but here the down force, um, it's a lot easier to see because if we look at the lift coefficient up here, which is the down force, you can't really see the lift curve very well. I think it's because they tested the angles in a very coarse way. Like there's only five degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, and 20 degrees, nothing between 15 and 20. So the resolution of this graph is not that great. So those minor details are a bit hard to tell. Whereas for the drag here, once you reach stall, it's usually more sensitive to the than the lift to um, the stall. So the reason is because, especially with thick wings, uh, we won't get like a dramatic stall. We will often get fairly gradual stall. So we will still produce pretty decent lift past the stall angle attack for a thick wing. And because this is a very thick wing, the stall pattern won't be nearly as obvious as if we had like a flat plate, for example. Whereas with the drag, the drag will still skyrocket because we do get a greater wake. And that happens regardless of whether you have a thin wing or a thick wing. It's still going to have quite a large increase. So I think the drag plot here is a better indicator of this particular wing for the stall because it's more sensitive to these characteristics. Anyway, in these graphs, we get some clues that kind of confirm that this wing was very cambered. We can tell that in the downforce graph on the top because if you were to draw a linear line from 10 degrees to 5 degrees and then extend that down to 0 degrees, you'll still produce good downforce at 0 degrees and actually about the amount you would expect with a 7% cambered wing, about 0.7 or so, or maybe a little bit less. That's about how much you'd expect. The drag plot in the second graph also confirms this because the drag bucket, so this quadratic shape that you get, is very offset from 0 degrees. It's more around 10 degrees. The minimum drag um, occurs here about that. For a symmetrical wing, this should be about zero degrees. So this offset indicates that we are getting a cambered wing here too. So these graphs match what the authors were saying about being a NACO 7048. Anyway, increasing the flow speed to 48 kph, so the bottom two graphs now, we have probably better agreement between the test results and the CFD, particularly at 20 degrees. That makes sense because I suspect that the discrepancy we saw in the second graph for the drag at 16 kph for 20 degrees was because the CFD was getting the boundary layer separation wrong. If you were to speed up the flow, in other words, increase the Reynolds number, the flow will stay attached over the wing surface better. So you can push to higher angles of attack without getting flow separation. What that means here is that at this higher speed of 48 kph, we should get less flow separation at 20 degrees so the CFD should give more accurate results here, and that's what we are seeing. Another way of telling that the flow is staying attached more at this higher speed is that if you look at the drag plot, so the bottom plot, the slope isn't nearly as curved, it's more linear. That suggests more attached flow at 20 degrees. So what we can conclude here is that the CFD is pretty good. Overall, there is good agreement. One place it breaks down is the boundary layer separation, which is the bane of most CFD simulations anyway. So I think going forward, we can trust the trends, especially if those trends occur over a range of flow speeds. Now, just quickly, this CFD was done with Star CCM Plus, which is a good CFD software, but expensive. If you'd like to learn a free and very powerful CFD software, then check out our courses on OpenFoam here. So now that we know that CFD is good, at least for general trends, let's look at the results of how different side slip angles affect a race car's aerodynamics. So in figure five, we see a generic race car cornering. The most important part here is this beta angle. That's the side slip angle. This is the angle of the incoming air to the car. As a result of this side slip angle, the incoming air can be decomposed to the air velocity in line with the car, 
which is VA here, and then the crosswind velocity, which is VW here, and then the overall velocity is just V. In table one, we see the resulting side slip velocity and the side slip angle with different inlet velocities. This is literally just a basic trigonometry decomposition. The in you're in decomposing the incoming flow into the side slip uh, flow, so that's very straightforward. You just use um, sine beta times by the, the incoming flow to get this crosswind velocity. So the maximum crosswind velocity occurs here in the bottom right, if we go down here. So at an inlet velocity of 60 kbh, the slice angle of 20 degrees gives us a crosswind velocity of 20.5 kbh. That's quite a lot. In table two, we see the windward velocity. So effectively, how much of the incoming air is going straight. And as you'd expect, most of it is in that general direction. Let's now move on to the findings. So in figure six, we see the effect of the side slip angle on the lift here, then the drag and side slip angles, uh, so, sorry, um, side coefficients at different speeds. The thing that stands out to me is that the lift and drag aren't always worse with increasing side slip angle. For example, in figure 6a, so this plot down here for the lift, we get a local maximum in the lift at zero degrees, which actually means we're getting less downforce at zero degrees, um, then if you were to go to like 10 degrees size slip angle, which is where you get more downforce produced, then it increases further to 20 degrees size slip, and that results in a global maximum for this coefficient. So it seems like a bit of a size slip angle is good here, which I'm very surprised at. I mean, if you were to look at figure three, which we get a picture of the actual car that they tested. Here we go. Um, I don't understand why a bit of side slip would increase the downforce. For example, for the rear wing, you have huge end plates. And if you had flow coming in at an angle to them, the flow will separate around the edge and a decent part of the rear wing will see bad flow now. So it won't work as well if you just had a straight on flow. The same general idea applies to the splitter, uh, the front splitter, for example. So I don't, I don't know, maybe the wheels are creating a positive effect where in a little bit of side slip that can increase downforce, I can definitely understand why going to too much greater side slip angle would reduce the downforce, but I don't understand why a little bit of side slip is better here. Anyway, coming back to figure six, we can see that there's definitely a little bit of a sweet spot for the downforce production. That's at about a 10 degrees side slip angle. And in the drag plot, so the top left plot here, we get an equally unusual trend here. One thing to note is that the drag coefficient uh, on this uh, vertical axis is actually inversed. I don't know why they did that. It makes it a little harder to read, but that's how it is. So what this means is that a higher val like a higher position on this graph is actually a lower drag coefficient, which is better. Anyway, the graph clearly shows that a little bit of side slip again, a few degrees, actually drops the drag coefficient. Again, I can't understand why any side slip should make a lot of the surface of the car stall. But for some reason, we don't get more drag for small slice up angles. Is it because maybe one side of the wheels are shielded? Wheels generally make up about 40% of the drag of an open wheel car. So I don't know, maybe the slice up angle is helping reduce the drag enough to override everything else there. Or maybe there's another reason happening. But once the slice up angle increases past five degrees, we get the expected increase in the drag option too. So that part makes sense. After seeing the lift and drag plots, I'd really be interested to see the flow vis from the CFD, but there's nothing in this paper. Now, another important point to note is that up until now, for pretty much all the force and torque data given here, the trends stay the same regardless of the inlet speed. So you can see the speed is changing along this, um, this axis here from like 25 to 60 kph. And the values are staying pretty similar. Definitely the trends are staying similar here. So what we're seeing here uh, of the local maximum and minimum for the lift and drag, they stay pretty much constant with different speeds that you're going at. So that's a very useful thing to know. Now the side force coefficient, so the last graph in figure six here, is the only one where there aren't really any surprises. It shows that the greater the side slip angle is, the greater the side force coefficient is. And that makes a lot of sense because the more you have the flow hitting the side of your car and pushing it sideways, the more there's gonna be a side force. That also shows why cornering is actually harder because you not only have centrifugal force throwing you out, but also aerodynamic forces doing the same here. So recapping the forces, a side slip can actually increase the downforce and reduce the drag if, if it's small enough.
but the latter case probably not like there's only a very small window here between zero and five seven point five degrees where you will get an increase in a down a reduction uh, drag for the former though for the um, downforce there's a good chance that you can increase the downforce just by size up in your car so that's really good but really weird and just as a quick note if you'd like us to simulate your very own car let us know here anyway moving on to the moments in figure seven so this uh, churro hill we see the effects of the size slip angle on the yawing moment so the top one the rolling moment the middle one and then sorry the bottom one and the pitching moment in the middle again the trends are pretty much independent of the flow speed so that's very nice the top plot is for the yaw, and this is how much the air is trying to twist the car off course. So how much it is trying to twist you left or right. The results here are pretty weird. There's a mat, there's a minimum um, where as the size of the angle increases to around 7.5 degrees, the yawing moment is the lowest, it's actually negative. But then increasing the size of the angle more results in a maximum for the yawing moment coefficient. I wonder if that has anything to do with the stalling where at a lower slice of angle the flow comes in at an angle and stays attached over certain surfaces but then as soon as the slice of angle increases more it separates and the yawing moment we had now flips the other way from a driving point of view this actually means that there is a range of slice of angles that will actually help you turn better so that's pretty good the other two graphs show the pitching moment uh, which uh, is how much you're rolling forwards or backwards and then the rolling moment coefficient which is kind of how much you're tilting kind of like how a boat tilts from side to side as it's on the water they are also affected and pretty much in an in a monotonic way where the greater the slice of angle is the more the coefficients change with the same trend so there's nothing really too unexpected here but i still can't get over how <laughs> how different slice of angles can improve downforce and the drag coefficient and even the yawing coefficient um that can help so this really needs further investigation to see is this just an anomaly for this car or if the same thing happens for a range of cars where there's a sweet spot if you were to turn at that angle you can actually improve your aerodynamics and with that we come to this podcast if you liked it hit the me like and subscribe buttons and if you want to learn open foam or if you like us to make your own car let us know in the links below and if you're staying on youtube youtube thinks you'll like this video so check it out peace out amigos